Hello, thanks for being here for Talking Europe. We are joined today from Cork by Ireland's Foreign and Defence Minister, Simon Coveney. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you very much for having me on. And uh, unfortunately, no, no shortage of uh, controversial and difficult issues to discuss at the moment. Indeed, yes, it's been an extremely busy time and uh, not just uh, in terms of your own government. I actually want to start by talking about your closest neighbour in Europe and what's going on in the United Kingdom. Uh, the governing Conservative Party, as you and our viewers are well aware, in the process of choosing a new leader who would, of course, become the British Prime Minister. Now, just recently, uh, your Fine Gael Party's Europe spokesperson, Neil Richmond, he made a comment about this. He said he had little faith that the next Conservative Prime Minister would be an improvement on what's gone before. Uh, how much faith do you have, Mr Coveney? Well, look, I think we have to wait and see. You know, I think um, we see this as an opportunity for a fresh start in terms of British-Irish relations. It's no secret that there has been a lot of tension between the two governments in recent years. And that's because, you know, we, um, we see the British government effectively breaking its word to Ireland and to the EU and legislating domestically to unilaterally breach an international treaty. And that has created a lot of tension because we know what that means. Uh, if, you, if you effectively dismantle uh, the withdrawal agreement that facilitated the United Kingdom leaving the EU in a structured and controlled way, uh, and you remove the protections for Ireland, North and South, that were in the Northern Ireland Protocol, which let's not forget, was a proposal that came from London, not from Dublin or from, uh, from Brussels. Uh, if you remove those protections, well, then we open up all over again some of the really difficult issues um, that we struggled to deal with mm. through the Brexit process, which took years uh, mm. to put together in terms of finalising that withdrawal agreement. So, so that has created tension. It's also created a very polarised political atmosphere in Northern Ireland which means that devolved government in Northern Ireland now isn't functioning um, because of the divisions linked to, to Brexit, its aftermath, its, its mm. disruption, and, of course, <laughs> the approach of the British government towards commitments that they've made in the past. So um, we hope that, you know, in a few weeks' time, at the start of September, we'll have a new Conservative Party leader, a new Prime Minister. We, of course, will respect that person. We'll try to work with them. And we'll try to get back to the partnership that really has been the basis for British-Irish relations for the last 25 years mm. since the peace agreement, which unfortunately for the last couple of years has been absent. And just before we move on to speaking about the detail of uh, those issues around Northern Ireland, Mr Coveney, uh, your current British counterpart as Foreign Minister, Liz Truss, is currently yeah. seen as being the front runner to become that next British Prime Minister. Uh, seeing as you, I assume, know her relatively well, would you welcome that uh, appointment? Well, look, I, I know Liz Truss well, and, and I wish her well. You know, I, I don't know Rishi Sunak as well, but I wish him well as well. You know, this is being British Prime Minister is a is a big, big job, uh, not just for Britain, but in terms of global politics. You know, Britain is a very significant global power. Uh, they're a, you know they're a permanent member on the UN Security Council. Uh, they're making a big contribution to European security and defence issues. And, of course, they're a really important partner in terms of how Europe responds to Russian aggression in Ukraine. Um, so for lots of reasons, uh, mm -hmm. a British prime minister is, uh, is a person that the Irish government wants to have a close relationship with. Let's not forget, any time there has been a real problem in the peace process in Northern Ireland, when parties are divided and can't find agreement, it's been the two governments that have come together to find common ground, to try to put a, a foundation there, if you like, to help the parties uh, meet in the middle uh, and move forward mm -hmm. in a way that protects the peace process and relationships. And without that partnership, um, then the British and Irish relationship uh, starts to corrode. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that also has a very negative, ne negative impact in Northern Ireland. And unfortunately, that has what, that's been what's happened in the last mm -hmm. number of years because of unilateral decision-making in Westminster, not just, by the way, on Brexit, but on a whole range of other issues as well that are very sensitive issues in Northern Ireland. And that is, that is a departure from both the spirit uh, of the Good Friday Agreement uh, and, and also one that has real consequences in terms of effect on the streets uh, of Northern Ireland.
Well, let's speak about uh, those issues in Northern Ireland. Uh, as you said, the protocol uh, being called into question uh, with the UK government pushing on with efforts uh, to pass its own law that uh, Westminster says would allow it to legally breach parts of the Northern Ireland protocol. Now, I, I recently interviewed Liz Truss for France well, 24. Well, and the, I, the, I just the British to... government says that, by the way. <laughs> I, I'm not sure Westminster says it. Well, uh, yes, sorry, the I British don't, government. I don't, know, I, I don't know any credible uh, lawyer outside of the British government uh, that thinks that this is not a breach of international law. If I just wanted to play you, Mr Coveney, and for our viewers as well, um, Liz Truss herself telling us on France 24 uh, her justification or part of it uh, for, for you to hear and for our viewers. And, and I'd like to get your response yeah. after that. So here's Liz Truss a couple of weeks ago. We are compelled to act and it is legal for us to act because of necessity. And there is an international doctrine of necessity that if state functions are being undermined, if political stability is, un is undermined, then a government does have mm. the ability and, in my view, the duty to act in this situation. But we are doing it because of those very serious political mm. stability. And to all those who say the majority in Northern Ireland think this or X thinks Y, the fact is the political institutions haven't been working since February. Mr Coveney, uh, what do you say to that, that the international doctrine of necessity applies in this case? Well, it doesn't, I'm afraid. Um, you know, that's an interpretation that uh, Liz Truss has, has put on it. That's the advice that, that she has got from her attorney general. Um, but we don't believe that that advice is sound, nor does the European Union, nor does the opposition in the UK, nor do former prime ministers nor does Theresa May, who was uh, the last prime minister in Britain. Mm -hmm. You know, so Ireland isn't alone in saying this. We're not saying it because we want to be awkward. We're saying it because the, the absolute um, centre of opinion, if you like, uh, in terms of legal opinion on this issue, is that the doctrine of necessity thresholds are not met in this case. Uh, there, there are alternatives. Uh, in terms of, uh, and of course, the doctrine of necessity means that there are no alternatives. Uh, there are alternatives through negotiation. Uh, Liz Truss has said that, um, that they've been negotiating for the last 18 months and they're getting nowhere. There has been no negotiation on the British side since the 11th of February. That's 160 days ago. The British no say that the European Commission isn't prepared to negotiate. It's not being flexible enough. No, what the British government is saying is that the European Commission won't change the treaty mm. and change the mandate for their negotiator, Mara Sefcovic, in Indeed. relation to the treaty. That's a very different thing to saying that the EU isn't willing to negotiate. Mm -hmm. The EU has already shown a commitment to compromise. The EU, through its negotiator, uh, Vice President Marge Sefcovic, last uh, October offered to reduce checks on goods coming into Northern Ireland and staying in Northern Ireland by 80% and to reduce the, um, the customs uh, checks by 50%. And they said that that was just a starting point as a basis for negotiation. So the EU has shown a willingness to implement the protocol with a lot of pragmatism, with a lot more flexibility than was originally envisaged. Uh, it is in many ways uh, willing to go to the very extremities of what's possible uh, within the legal framework of the withdrawal agreement in order to show compromise, to respond to unionist concerns in Northern Ireland and their genuine concerns. But it seems it's never enough for the British government. And so instead of negotiating, they have decided, in my view, for domestic political reasons, uh, reasons uh, within the Conservative Party in London, uh, they have decided to act unilaterally, uh, to send all of those signals to the EU that actually, if you don't give us what we want, mm -hmm. we're going to take it anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that is not the way for British government to interact with its neighbours and its friends and its allies. And that's why uh, the approach that the British government has taken uh, has, has received such a negative response from partners across the EU. It's not just Ireland, which is why we hope that whether it's Prime Minister Truss or Prime Minister Sunak, that we will see a willingness now to open up a serious and honest dialogue about how we solve these problems through negotiation, as opposed to continuing to pursue a unilateral strategy of breaching international law, which, apart from anything else, sets a terrible uh, precedent and gives an awful signal to the rest of the world at a time when we're trying to hold countries to international law, mm. in particular mm. Russia.
Indeed. And we've just got a very brief amount of time left to speak about Russia, about Ukraine. Uh, another of your foreign minister counterparts uh, in the news these last couple of days, the Hungarian foreign minister, Peter Siato, in Moscow, negotiating extra imports from Russia of gas into Hungary at a time when the rest of the EU is trying to reduce its imports. Uh, what do you make of this? Is this Hungary undermining the EU? Look, it's not welcome. You know, I mean, we, the, the EU has committed uh, to actually wean itself off a reliance on Russian oil and gas permanently. Um, and so, you know, instead of uh, looking to increase gas flows from Russia into the EU, uh, we need to be looking for alternatives, and we are. Uh, the Commission this week announced that, uh, that the EU may have to look at reducing its consumption of gas by up to 15% mm -hmm. next winter in terms of preparing for... Uh, for what may happen in the months ahead should Russia choose to, to shut off gas supplies as part of the response to, uh, to sanctions and so on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are planning for the future. Uh, the European Union has shown extraordinary solidarity um, and needs to continue to do that. Uh, and, you know, one, one EU member state shouldn't be going in a different direction. Um, and certainly from an Irish perspective, our view is that uh, we need to continue to actually increase the impact of sanctions and increase the cost to Russia of continuing this war. Uh, because we know the humanitarian uh, uh, consequences of it. I mean, so far, more than 7 million people have had to flee in just over four months into the EU. Uh, 42,000 of those have come to Ireland. Um, you know, this is extraordinary human suffering. We've got to find a way of bringing, to, bringing it to an end. And one of the ways in which, which we can do that is to increase, increase the economic cost to Russia of continuing mm -hmm. this war, which means tougher sanctions. Simon Coveney, Irish Foreign and Defence Minister, thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you. Anytime. And thanks to you for watching. See you very soon here on France 24.